We know that there's clinical utility with a lot of genetic testing for cancer. So with genetic testing, again, it's no different from any other testing. In medicine, we get ourselves in trouble all the time by just ordering a test because it seems like a good idea, and then we get something back that we didn't anticipate, and then we're kind of stuck. So the truth is, whether we're talking about a blood count or a screening test, a mammogram, or anything else, if we don't know why we're doing it, we might get ourselves in trouble with the answer. So with new tests, it starts with, will it answer a question that I logically want to ask? Will it answer it reliably? Will it have good performance characteristics, sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value? And then secondary to that, because my first fiduciary responsibility is good medical care, but a close second is financial fiduciary. So what is the cost? What's the insurance coverage? How likely is it going to be that this test will get covered by insurance or be affordable to the patient when I order it? When thinking about whether to order a cancer gene panel or just a single cancer gene test, it really comes down to what you think is going on. Understanding what you want to ask with your test and then ordering a, the test to answer that question. So if I think my patient has a very precise syndrome, if I'm thinking Cowden syndrome due to mutations in the PTEN gene, then I'm just going to order that. On the other hand, if I've got a patient with breast cancer and Cowden syndrome is just one of many possible conditions on the list, then maybe a panel is much more appropriate. And in fact, there's been some interesting financial analysis done in recent years that's starting to suggest that it may be more cost effective to do a panel than a series of single gene tests. Again, unless you've got good clinical evidence that pushes very strongly towards the more narrow specific syndrome. And then there's the question of if there's a test available that queries every known cancer predisposing gene, would it be better to just order that test as opposed to a single gene or a panel of genes associated with the cancer of interest, be it breast or colon or something else? The downside to that is if you query hundreds or thousands of genes, just like if you run hundreds or thousands of any other tests, you'll just by statistical random chance find several things that are abnormal or perhaps appear abnormal but maybe have no clinical significance whatsoever. And trying to decipher among those handful or dozens of abnormal results that might come from such a broad question as the cancer genome test, well, that can be challenging. Which ones really need action and which ones are innocent bystanders? So I think there's a lot more we need to learn before we're ready to do broad cancer genome testing or whole exome testing in people for whom we don't have a specific question in mind. The day is coming, I think, that we can use these tests in a much more powerful, predictive way. There's a lot more to learn before it's time to do that yet. Are there situations in which I would test when a patient doesn't meet criteria? So I'll admit before everyone watching this video that I'm not a big fan of guidelines and regulations. So I find them helpful, especially in cases where I or anyone else really doesn't know what to do. But I think of them as guidelines and not as rules. So if I and the patient discuss the situation and conclude that testing has some value, even if they don't meet guidelines, and if the patient is ready and willing and able to meet the financial responsibility, then we proceed with testing. It really becomes a matter of, like anything else, understanding what are the risks and benefits, what are we going to learn from it, and knowing that we're going outside of guidelines and third-party payers are less likely to reimburse for something outside of the guidelines, they have to be prepared to bear the financial burden.